we had no idea that 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 was going to happen and I don't think anybody in the city had any real understanding of how bad this could be. Nobody really ever expected no uh, 30 foot flood coming down here, you know. In Cedar Rapids we went over 10 feet above a record and it was just amazing. Usually when you break a record you only break it by a little bit. You don't break it by over 10 feet. Yeah, well the year started with, you know, the near record snowfall in Cedar Rapids of almost 60 inches and then you have a spring where there's all kinds of rainfall. And then in Cedar Rapids specifically, one of the reasons that it flooded so high was because the day before our crest, um, you'll recall the flash flooding we had. Three to six inches of rain fell kind of around the metro area, and that just took all that water that was already rising and uh, made it come up even higher than it was expected to. It was a huge responsibility. They were depending on us. People watched us to know what to do. They didn't know what to do and people didn't know where to get the water that they needed to drink. They didn't know, um, you know, where to get food. We've all covered breaking news before. We do it every day. But to cover it in a situation where people's lives are immediately at risk and their livelihoods are not only at risk, but in some cases lost, it was very overwhelming. It's the old saying, you know, I never thought it would happen here. You never thought it would happen here. And it got to everybody. It, um, it's, it's just something that, it's hard to watch wherever it happens. Um, it's harder to watch it with your own eyes. Hello again and welcome to TV9's continuing coverage of the devastating floods of 2008. I see some houses down there already have water up to their windows, so it's just kind of scary, I guess, but we're doing all we can out here. See the cows on the corner? How long have they been up there? Two days, a day and a half, they're not going to make it. You keep thinking there's got to be some end to this everywhere, but every time we turn around, there seems to be another community, another neighborhood, another uh, uh, part of the eastern Iowa that uh, is just being devastated by this flooding. Before the end of the day, uh, we're going to see a tremendous amount of water here in Palo. Many of the bridges in downtown Cedar Rapids, including this one, the 3rd Avenue Bridge, are closed, and they're planning to close most, if not all, of the bridges by later on this evening. There's really not much you can do to keep the water back. It obviously is just rising up here too quickly for anyone to really be able to handle it. It's incredible. And it just keeps raining too. Everything I've worked my entire life for is here. You know, it breaks your heart to think all the people who spent time and effort sandbagging, and you look at that and right. sandbags have no match. I'm here now with City Council Member Brian Fagan, and you have something to tell people about the water system. Yeah, it's important that uh, we limit uh, the water usage for human consumption only. Conserve water to the utmost and only use water when you absolutely have to, to drink. All you can do, and this is where we are now, is protecting lives. Another rescue, and they are sending more boats out to get ready to go start rescuing more people. 8,000 people have evacuated just in Cedar Rapids. Uh, shelters are taking in as many as they can. We will not turn people away. I, I think probably one of the biggest things is to keep the faith. Four days ago, I was kind of laughing, thinking, oh, it's not going to get this bad. In Iowa City, you should be prepared to be evacuated and please get your things ready. They're trying desperately to save the library on the U of I campus. Obviously, nobody has seen any, anything like this. You know, everybody wants to go in and see what their house looks like, and it's just not safe. If we're not showing your neighborhood, it's because we can't get there. People in Coralville and Iowa City, we hear your pleas for coverage. I understand we have video in-house. If we could rush it upstairs and even run it raw. Is that it? That's amazing. <laughs> This could not happen. I could lose everything. Now we're going to find out if Cedar Rapids is truly the great city that I believe it is. Even though we are mourning, as we look at the building, we don't fear the future. We know from past history that Iowans will come out of this and come out of it stronger than ever. We're going to make it, yes. but uh, it is really, really going to be a struggle for a lot of people.
These are some of the stories from the flood of 2008, told by the people who covered it and those who lived through it. Coming up on KCRG TV 9 News at 6, Cedar Falls orders some people to evacuate parts of that city because of rising floodwaters. And the floodwaters cause a bridge to go down in Waterloo. We'll have a live report coming up. And will sandbagging efforts save this Lynn County town? The flood of 2008 is proving to be just too much for many communities all across eastern Iowa. Thanks for joining us for this special hour-long edition of KCRG TV9 News at 6. We're bringing you extensive coverage of the flood of 2008. Many people have had to evacuate their homes. In Cedar Falls, we've just learned a presidential disaster has been declared. Josh Hinkle is live in Cedar Falls tonight where volunteers are trying to save that city from the flooding Cedar River. Josh? Now the river is quickly rising here to the top of the levee. Their biggest fear is if this rip, if this levee actually breaks. Now, as long as that doesn't happen, this is helping the city stay on its way to saving itself. An army of volunteers now protects downtown from the Cedar River. Nearly 500 people from all walks of life. Crews already evacuated this area, except for anyone willing to grab a bag. They knew if they didn't sandbag at the top of the levee that there was going to be a big problem. And as we were there for the re remainder of the day, the water kept rising and rising and rising. And pretty soon it was to the top of the levee. I mean, if they, if they wouldn't have had the sandbags there, it could have very clearly just gone straight over the levee right into downtown. Well, we all had a sense that it could be something very serious once, once we saw what was going on in Cedar Falls. The floodwaters have destroyed at least two bridges today. The largest one was in Waterloo. KCRG TV 9's Justin Foss is there live tonight. Bruce, I want to show you just how bad the flooding is right now. This is what it's like coming up to one of these bridges. That is why right now there is only one bridge still open here in downtown Waterloo. That's the Forest Street Bridge down there. The reason it's still open, it's the highest. City officials in Waterloo have a good reason to close the bridges. At 2.30, the railroad bridge crossing the Cedar went. Some watched it happen. Others lived it. All of a sudden, the rail just started screaming, and it started just ripping the rails right off underneath our feet. And then all of a sudden, we heard a big pop, and the center of the bridge broke. Now, the Lynn County Supervisors issued a state of emergency today, meaning that they can use available emergency funds and apply for state assistance. The disaster declaration includes the town of Palo. KCRG TV 9's John Campbell is live with details on the evacuations going on in Palo. John? Well, Bruce and Beth, we were in Palo at mid afternoon. That's where Marilyn Bard, a longtime Palo resident, told us 1993 was the big one. This is going to be the giant one. Palo officials must have agreed with Marilyn Barta's forecast because at 1.30 they issued a voluntary evacuation order effective at 4 p.m. They were urging people to pack up and move out, and that was exactly what Carrie Ford was doing when we dropped by her house, where water was already six inches deep in the basement. Um, we're just taking stuff out of the house and putting it up in the very top of the garage because mm -hmm. they're saying that it's probably going to get up to the door handle in the garage before it's all said and done. Marilyn Barta told us she will stay overnight and then make her decision. By the way, the house she is advertising as lakeside property was elevated four feet after the 93 flood. She's hoping that will do the job and keep her dry. Many of us were here in 1993 when the floods came through, knew what that did, um, and expected similar. But then as the water continued to rise, we knew that it would be much more devastating, much more extreme, um, as that water just continued to mount up to higher and higher and ultimately record levels throughout most of Iowa. Cedar Rapids has forced about eight homeowners to leave their property because of the rising Cedar River. The city has also passed out these flyers in several neighborhoods that are near the river. The paper warns people that they might have to evacuate if the water gets too high. In Waterloo, it was flooded. Uh, the flooding was square blocks. In Cedar Rapids, it was square miles. This was like nothing we had ever been through. And um, 
I think what was amazing was everybody from all departments of the company, it didn't matter what department they worked in, everybody showed up and quite honestly, we needed every person, we needed every camera, we needed every live truck. You had every staff member from the entire building working double, triple duty. I know like for instance, you know, we had our entire sales team down in the newsroom helping to answer phones and helping to get information out to people who needed it, who were calling us. Oh, it has to be one of the biggest news events I ever covered. I don't know if there will ever be a bigger one. I was talking to a friend who uh, works in the business up in Minneapolis, and he said, isn't it strange, John, here you've done sports all these years, and probably the biggest story you will have ever covered is a, is a flood in, in Cedar Rapids, and I, I think he hit it right on, probably. I know he did. We got the call at about 3 a.m. that morning from one of our managers saying they're evacuating some homes in the Czech village. I heard, Jerry, Jerry, get out of bed, get up. And I said, okay. <laughs> so, and then we staggered around and uh, I got to talking with my neighbor there out on the outside. I mean, we grabbed up a few items and, and uh, they looked at us and said, hey, you folks don't have time. People had been evacuated, but as we were there throughout the morning, they came back. and. People didn't believe that this flood was going to be so huge in that area. They said, okay, we'll get out, but everybody anticipated maybe within a day we're going to be back and everything's going to be all right. I knew what happened in 93, so I put sandbags around window, got my sump pump going in there and uh, thought everything's going to be okay. And uh, lo and behold, Mother Nature took care of everything. From your 24-hour news source, KCRG-TV9, this is coverage of breaking news. We are bringing you the latest on the flooding from Waterloo through Cedar Rapids and what has happened since the Coralville Reservoir has gone over that spillway. In Cedar Rapids, we must start there because the city of Cedar Rapids has just expanded its mandatory evacuation. They're saying the flooding they're expecting will be like the 500-year floodplain that we were fearing. I remember walking outside of the building here on 2nd Avenue and you could see the water and you could see it coming and you could see people around you sandbagging and every time uh, somebody had a, a, a moment to look at that it, it was just kind of very sobering in that, um, that this wasn't a story you were covering anymore, it was happening right where you were. Joe, this has just come in. Cedar Rapids has now issued a mandatory evacuation for everyone, all businesses, all homes, within the 500-year floodplain. Joe, you may be more familiar with this than, than I am. The 500-year floodplain, that means about every 500 years they expect a flood of this magnitude? When the phrase 500-year floodplain first came into our coverage, I really didn't comprehend what it meant. We hadn't talked about the 100-year floodplain or the 500-year floodplain. Really, we talked in terms of, is it going to be like 93? Is it going to be worse than 93? Because that we could comprehend. To be honest, Beth and I had to be corrected on what the definition of a 500-year flood was because I think nobody really had a, a real understanding of exactly what that terminology means. And Joe came out one time and explained it to us. There's 100 and 500 year flood plains and indeed what you're looking at now in the graphic in red is the area that would be expected to uh, see a 500 year flood. These areas will be affected as you can see in downtown Cedar Rapids. It, it was scary. Uh, when you look at the map that shows the 500 year flood plain and you see how much of Cedar Rapids is included in that area and you hear that they're evacuating in that area, the water is still rising, we're not even close yet to what they're predicting for a crest, I think it was very scary. KCRG TV9's Josh Hinkle standing by. Josh, I know you've been out there all day and you've seen the waters rise. Well, Beth, this is the biggest news right now, and spectators are just all over the 3rd Avenue Bridge. Officials had no other choice but to close the 3rd Avenue, 1st Avenue, and 16th Avenue bridges at this time because the water is rising so quickly, so fast. If you want to take a look over here now, you can see how quickly the water is actually rushing 
close to the top of the Third Avenue Bridge. It appears likely that all downtown bridges except for the Interstate 380 Bridge will close by this evening. As you watched the river coming up and covering the bridges, and you knew that a lot of this stuff would not be this, most of it would not ever be the same again. I remember sitting there with a photographer, Dane and I were, were there, and we're looking at the water and we're going, boy, I wonder if the water is actually going to go up over the bridge. You know, we kept going, oh, I doubt that's going to happen, or how strange would that be if it actually came up over the bridge? Look at the city of El Cater, what's happened there and the flooding it's dealing with. It's really been a shock because it's been flooded out twice recently. And now we have this downpour that they're experiencing on the already flooded city streets. TV9's Dubuque reporter Katie Wiedemann is live on Newsline 9 and was in El Cater today. Katie, what can you tell us? Today, Highway 13 that runs through downtown El Cater is completely closed to traffic. And several downtown businesses are also closed. While owners and friends are cleaning up the mud and water damage, people around the town are just trying to make sense of everything and figure out what to do next, and the rain is coming down there. The city of Vinton upriver from Cedar Rapids on the Cedar River is also battling the rising floodwaters, and the people there have had another problem to deal with as well, and that is no power. This is the Cedar River as it heads into Vinton. Bart Cleansing has lived on this river his entire life. Highest I've ever seen it, and uh, they're saying it's right now about 21 something, and they're expecting two more feet on top of this. That's that's Mary Williams, my mom's house. When did you get her out? Uh, Sunday. Earlier, Bart had evacuated Charlie Lau from his farm, but check out Charlie's front porch. Yes, cows on the porch. See the cows on the corner. How long have they been up there? Two days, a day and a half. They're not gonna, they're not gonna make it. And this is what it looked like on the north end of Vinton at noon. Water everywhere. Uh, we're continuing to sandbag in the uh, north section of Vinton. Uh, we've got many blocks underwater, houses that are, uh, water's up in, into the first floors probably by this time, not the basements. Uh, the electrical generation plant, uh, they, they lost that. It's got water in it. Uh, Vinton is without power right now. I don't believe right now there's power anywhere here in town. The power went out in Vinton between 8 and 9 this morning, but there was plenty of human power. Hundreds of volunteers working the sandbag brigade in the city square. National Guardsmen and Benton County inmates helping place sandbags. The jail was actually surrounded by water and the inmates were scheduled to be evacuated to other sites about 1 o'clock. Meanwhile, the river was rising and the rain was coming down. And Craig Griffith was just one of hundreds of volunteers doing his part. That's all we can do. The, the town is going underwater, so we're trying to save it. That is the north section of town. There's really only one way into Vinton. You've got to come from the south because the bridges are closed up there. I just talked to Bart Cleansing, the guy who gave me the tour in his boat on the river today. He said power is still out in Vinton. He said the water is up another six inches from when I was there just a couple of hours ago. I heard Joe say it's 23 feet, so uh, it's about 23 feet and it's still coming up in Vinton. I can recall many conversations that I had with uh, other guys in the weather lab, with Josh and Kai specifically, just about the fact that people haven't seen this. We're talking about record flooding, uh, much less just disastrous flooding, and what's going to happen will just amaze us as will amaze other people. In June, right before the flood happened, we had a lot of thunderstorm lines come through that caused, you know, flash flooding, not just an inch here and there. It was like five or six inches in certain spots, and it was just in the, you know, if you're to have a flood and a major flood, somehow that five or six inch rain just fell in the right spot. This time around, we are looking at historic levels on the area of rivers. We've never seen these levels before. It's a wet day on Thursday. We're talking about the potential again for some heavy rains into early Friday. 
any additional rain that falls has not been calculated into some of those river crest forecasts, mm -hmm. so some of those could even crest higher. And they keep looking at them and changing the models to... Absolutely, just because of the fact that it's historic. No one has ever experienced this before. We knew that things were going to be a problem then later on in the week, but I don't think anybody anticipated the river ever reaching over 31 feet. June 12th was an extremely challenging and sobering day here at our office because that was the day when we were seeing the heavy rainfall falling. We were adding to the crest as it came down the Cedar River. This is an estimation according to our radar of how much rain we have received in the last 24 hours in the yellows depicting areas that we've potentially had over three inches of rain and that has been the case especially in the southern portions of Benton County, northern portions of Lynn County and then stretching back up the 380 corridor toward Waterloo and all this water since it has no place to go coming downstream that's just going to keep the Cedar and Iowa rivers extremely high for some time to come. Now from a hydrologic perspective, this was a worst case scenario because we had really heavy rainfall, we had the setup for record flooding, and then as that crest worked its, worked its way down the river, rain kept on falling and adding to the crest. So that's how you get the worst crest possible by adding to the crest as it keeps on going down the river, and that's exactly what happened in this event. I remember thinking the only thing that could make this worse is if it started raining and then sure enough it started raining and it wasn't just a little rain, it was like a major downpour and it was made everything more challenging for everyone and I think everyone was already so stressed out, having rain just made everything worse. I remember going home on that Wednesday night and the bridges were already closed and I think we were looking at a, a crest of a little over 24 feet the next day is what they were predicting and the first inkling I had of what had happened overnight was when I just looked down 2nd Avenue and saw all that water. And I'll never forget how much the impact of, my, of that when it hit me on, on what was happening to the city. With this flood being unprecedented, unprecedented levels, the river became so high in places that it was hitting structures like bridges that were causing the river levels to increase rapidly. That happened in Cedar Rapids, it happened in Iowa City, it happened at locations downstream to where when the river hits a bridge, depending on the design of the bridge, it can result in a rapid rise on the river level. I think seeing the uh, Crandic Bridge down in the water I think seeing all the houseboats up against the uh, bridge that goes over to Quaker Oats there, th those are shots that, that uh, really stand out to me and, and told me how serious the situation was. To use the analogy of you're driving your car down the interstate at 60 miles an hour and you hit the brakes real fast, the back end of the car raises up. The same thing happened with the floodwaters on these rivers. The water is going along real fast, it's a structure like a bridge that forces the water to stop very quickly, the water does the same thing in response. It raises its level up. This was happening so quickly, no one predicted, first of all, that it would get to that point, but it was happening even faster than we could have ever anticipated, and this was truly an emergency situation. We are now going to go to TV9's Mark Geary, who's also been in downtown Cedar Rapids assessing the situation. Mark? That's right, Beth. You can see right here behind me, these are people from the theater, Cedar Rapids. They obviously didn't expect the water would get to this point in the downtown area. We're right on 3rd Street here, and they're basically trying to pull whatever they can out of the building. To try to imagine what that water was doing to the interior of that beautiful theater was, uh, was beyond belief. Those beautiful organs in there, that was a, a huge concern, and it still is. They're, you know, they're still trying to restore and, and save them. 
well. It's a very frantic scene right here. People, they're running in and out of the building, basically trying to salvage whatever they can. Theater of Cedar Rapids obviously puts on a lot of shows that are very popular for people here in the downtown Cedar Rapids area. Now, if you take a look over here, this is the intersection of 3rd Street and 2nd Avenue. Look at how much water is here right now. And in fact, I'd say about 15 minutes ago or so, there was actually a boat going by. So that gives you an idea of just how deep the water is. When we kept going back to all the different reporters that were out in the field and they kept saying the water's rising, the water's rising, it was hard to really quantify how fast it was rising and how much water had risen over a period of time. So Justin Foss, who's a pretty clever reporter and tends to come up with things that are outside of the box, put a cone down and over time, like after 30 minutes or an hour, showed how much closer the water had gotten. So I was trying to figure out how I can explain to people how, how deep it is. And so in, the, in my background here, back there, you're going to see my cone. What I did is I was with photographer Randy Dirks, and we were in our live truck, and I had these cones sitting in the back that we used to, um, to keep people away from where we are. And I pulled one out, and I set it on the ground, and I said, this is where the water line is. Randy, if you can zoom out here, I want to show you this is why we know it has been getting more deep. It's been getting deeper. This is a cone that, uh, according to my watch, I put out here just more than a half hour ago. It was completely out of the water a half hour ago. Now you can see just how quickly the water is rising. It was the only thing I could find that would really use as a, as a model, to use as a, as a marker to show people where the water was. And, and I, since then, it's been kind of famous put my fingers in here, you know, that's up to my second knuckle. That's probably three inches just within the last half hour. That is how quickly the water is going right now. So when Justin put that cone down and showed how fast the water was reaching it and how he kept having to move it, everybody realized this is real. This is, this is happening. And we're learning through a cone. It was almost a little bit of comic relief. Justin provided a lot of that during the flood coverage. Thank goodness. This cone here is going to tell the story all day long. I think I'm probably going to leave that as a reference all day. It's just amazing just to see how fast the water is rising. Overwhelming. It's terrible. Just complete devastation. It's very upsetting. You know, I, I guess I'm not, I'm not surprised that there were the, the number of rescues that we had. I mean, you know, at first you're thinking, well, why, why are people staying in their homes and whatnot? And it, the more I think about it, the more I think that if my home was down there, what would I have done, you know? And, and I think it just, nobody was prepared for how fast and how high the river was gonna get. And so I think we caught a lot of people by surprise. Normally we're driving our fire trucks on the streets and uh, this instance we were driving boats on the street. So it was a little, a little surreal seeing our neighborhood in that, in that state. They have been rescuing people nonstop. In fact, if you want to look behind me here, here is another group of people being rescued right now from the house. People were, were scared and confused, I would call it. Um, people didn't really know what, what to do. They just knew they needed help. And uh, uh, we had, you know, if they had pets, we'd, we'd take their pets with them. Other than that, it was pretty much, let's get in the boat and get to dry ground. The water just keeps rising. The rain just keeps falling. Uh, uh, these people have to be absolutely exhausted at this point, but uh, they, you know, bless their hearts, they just yeah. keep going at it. I'd get reports back, they said, you know, the closer you get to the river, the faster and more dangerous it is. And there were certain, there were certain um, points to where it was like, all right, we cannot go beyond there just because our boats aren't powerful enough. That main channel is moving so fast. We never have had anything close to water levels like this. And that's past. why the mandatory evacuations are anticipating to increase. And when they say you have to get out, you really do have to get out. The reports in Cedar Rapids where they're guesstimating that 100 people have had to be rescued. And I asked the, the fire department, I said, what do I have to do to be able to go with you guys? And this is the first time I actually got to see the extent of what this flood was going to be. Because at first, we didn't know how bad it was until we went out there 
And it was, it was incredible because these houses were, I mean, it was up over the front, their front doors. We went along on the ride assuming that we were just going to get a tour of the area. But what it turned out to be was that the fire department was going back to the fire station to get some vital records that they needed to have. And we get to the central fire station and it, it's up to their awning and just above their doors. And they're trying to, trying to get underneath the awning and there's not enough room. I had to lay down on, on, the, on the floor of the boat because my camera wouldn't fit underneath the awning on my shoulder. So I had to lay down to shoot. You'll see in the, the video that we have that they are just cracking away at the side of the fire station at these windows to try and break them open. And they can break them, but not big enough to be able to crawl through. Because we don't want to just break the windows. We need to get a person in there safely. So we don't know what to do. I can blow a window. I can bust the window with my bow all out. Now, for any TV journalist, this is about as good as it gets. Because we're thinking, oh my gosh, I've got the video of the century right here. This is going to be awesome. It was raining cats and dogs at the time. Amazing how hard it was raining. And the water got onto our camera and into our camera that our camera died. The thing that uh, got missed because my camera went down is they actually were using the boat to ram into uh, uh, the doors, into the, the glass windows to break in. And it was, you couldn't believe that you were seeing this, that you were actually part of this. How long have you been out on the streets of Cedar Rapids so far today, Josh? Well, today, I mean, I've been out since this morning. And you know, we went out, uh, Travis Bakken's dead, he's one of our photographers. And the first thing we saw was this boat that was just gearing up to go. And we're like, what's going on? Yeah. And so we saw these people and asked them. And they said that there were people trapped inside of Alliant Energy. So we got to go with them. And this is some of the shots that we saw. 16 people trapped in the city's tallest building depended on the quick rescue response of Guy Ayers and his sons. They did a sweep from the top floor all the way down to the bottom to make sure nobody was uh, left in the building. Ayers owns a local diving company and regularly responds to disasters like hurricanes. But now his mission is here for the people in Alliant Tower who thought they had enough time to grab some supplies and get out before it was too late. The bridges were completely covered. I mean, all you could see was the top of their railings and the water was just rushing over it. And then in town where the streets were, the current was so strong that you, just looking at the alleys, you could see the water just sucking things into the alleys. They say the river rushing through alleys would easily sweep a swimmer away. The strength of the water was enough to bust business doors off their hinges. With its destination in the distance, Ayer's crew encountered plenty of its own problems. Furniture, large appliances, and entire cars were among the barriers floating toward the boat. Um, it's kind of scary because you don't know if you're going to be going into the river or hit a building or what, something could go wrong easily. The water deepened the closer they came to the river, now rolling over the railings of its bridges. The evacuees, finally on board, then knew how dangerous their downtown trip really was. It's going way quicker than it was, and is it? Their tour back to dry land was one of complete disaster. The federal courthouse, the Paramount Theater, and the public library joined nearly every downtown business in the river. This complete devastation. It's very upsetting. They say if it hadn't been for Ayers and his sons, leaving might also have meant losing their lives. There were so many times during our coverage where what we were seeing really hit Beth and me emotionally. And one of those times, of course, was the first time we saw that aerial coverage, that aerial, that video of how widespread that, uh, that flooding had become. When you see landmark structures in the city uh, that are underwater, it really, really was just breathtaking in a way, uh, taking your breath away when you, you look at it and, and realize how devastating all of this really is. I kind of had a chance to see the flood from a, a vantage point that very few got to see it because I went up uh, in a helicopter about five times, I believe, over the course of the, the flood and when it was really high. 
When John Campbell came back from the first helicopter ride, we didn't get a chance to see the video in our newsroom before we saw it on the air. And when they pressed play upstairs and we got those first images of what looked like houses drowning, we didn't speak. We all just sat there. We didn't know what to say. And John Campbell, of course, saw it himself from the helicopter, and he was able to talk us through it. But I think Bruce and I were in a state of shock. And then we had to sort of get our bearings. What are we looking at? Earlier today, I had a chance to go up in the helicopter. We were supposed to go up at 6.30, too much lightning. We finally got in the air at 10.30, and I think what the folks are going to see, if they hadn't seen it yet, will we'll stun them. Let's go to that. We're heading down the Cedar River. This is the Ellis Boat Harbor. Lots of boat houses in here, as you can see, many askew, many tipped, many leaning water way up, way up. This is right along Ellis Boulevard. Still in that same area, this is what is known as the Time Check neighborhood. Look at the depth of the water. Look how high it's coming on those houses, how high it's coming on those garages. That's where the levee normally protects these houses, the water breached that. Downtown, First Avenue Bridge, this is about 10.30 this morning. Every time we got new video on of a boat tour or John's aerials, we were seeing those for the first time when the viewer was seeing those for the first time. And it was hitting us just as hard as it was the viewer at home too, because this is our community. These are our friends. The video from the air was just amazing. And John Campbell, obviously amazing journalist, you know, wonderful camera person, and could just, just really, as he came back and shared the aerials day in and day out, let the pictures tell the story. It gave you an idea of the scope and the magnitude of the, the disaster that we were witnessing. And, uh, it, uh, you're, you're a long way from the human suffering, but you know it's down there. That night, we were just giving out evacuation orders. That's what it seemed like the news was coming in, uh, which streets had to evacuate, you know, Rompot, areas of time check. It was near 10 o'clock, I believe, and I'm sitting at my desk, uh, monitoring my phone, and I get a call from this contact I have at the city. But the morning of June 12th, late morning, uh, we started to lose several critical uh, well locations. And those wells, what they do is they feed water, raw water, to the treatment plant. And the wells in our lowest locations were the first to go down. And most of those wells fed our northwest water plant. This became the most critical point at that, at that juncture in the whole city. We knew if we lost this well, we would lose drinking water in the city. So I remember Brian Fagan came up to me and said, we've got to tell everybody that they need to conserve water. Mark Geary live at downtown Cedar Rapids with some more important information. Mark? Okay. Uh, that's right, Bruce and Beth. I'm here now with City Council Member Brian Fagan, and you have something to tell people about the water system. Yeah, it's important that uh, we limit uh, the water usage for human consumption only at this point. Uh, we're losing some power to our well fields, and we're not able to get the water from the fields and into the plant, and we're at, we're, our plants are operating at about 25 percent capacity. What happened was we ran out of bags, and uh, sand in bags. Public works was flooded. So we had, we had bags available and we had sand in trucks, but we didn't have sand in bags. And we couldn't keep up with uh, the river at that point. And so I made a call into EOC that we needed volunteer help. We needed people to come down, help us put uh, sand in bags, and possibly help us bag. Our producer said to Bruce and I in our, in our earpiece, you have to go to Justin right away. You have to go to Justin. He called the control room and we were again in the height of live nonstop coverage. And he said, I have to get on the air now. And when he said it that way, you believe someone. What I have right now is a very important information for anybody that has a little extra time. The city is in dire need of sandbaggers right now to help protect the, uh, the city's only suction well left. They usually have four suction wells operating. There are three down right now. This is the only suction well left operating in the city. It is over in the Edgewood area. And so they're putting out a call to anybody that has time right now to help sandbag. 
And I said the directions probably about four times. And, and Beth says, are you telling me, because we were just told that the water situation was okay, are you telling me that we're in the process of possibly losing the city's water supply? And I said, yes. I just got off the phone with one of my sources and he says that uh, they have about 10 volunteers there, but they need to fill 6,000 sandbags and they need to do it as soon as absolutely possible. I estimate uh, anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 people came. We did know that we were down to almost nothing for water. And the fact that the call went out and 1,200 people showed up in less than half an hour for the purpose of sandbagging and holding that last well was just so wonderful in terms of what the people of Cedar Rapids will do for each other. It was beautiful in the midst of all this mess. I guess it was kind of one place where the whole city came together and beat the, beat the river back. So um, this, the people of Cedar Rapids saved their own drinking water. Losing water is something that hits everybody, every home in the community, very, very hard. And so there was a, a real urgency there for Justin to get that information on the air and for us to encourage people to get out there and sandbag, and it worked. It really did work. We went to Justin, he put out the plea for help. Not hours later, we we're getting information from the city that no more sandbaggers at that site. We have plenty of people uh, that were turning people away. And instead of just turning people away to have them go back home, they're going to Mercy Hospital. And that's when, you know, that's a whole nother story. We had been doing live shots all day long on Thursday in downtown Cedar Rapids, watching the water come up closer and closer and closer, and it got to about midnight, and they said, okay, we're going off the air, and we kind of felt a sense of relief because it just had been a really long day trying to you know, follow this story all day long on TV, doing live shots you know, every 10 to 15 minutes. And then, literally, as soon as we were ready to bring the live truck back to Cedar Rapids, I got a phone call from the news director here, Becky Luchin Gardner, and she said, you need to head over to Mercy Hospital, it's flooding. And I couldn't believe it. I thought, that's really far away from the river. How in the world can Mercy Hospital be flooding? We had a break in our coverage to do weather updates. Uh, in the weather lab. So Bruce and I had a moment to step off the set and get a drink of water. And when I stepped off the set, the first person I saw was Justin Foss putting on these huge waders. I go, where are you going? He goes, we hear something's going on at Mercy. I'm just gonna walk over there from the station. It's only a few blocks away. And I go, okay, well, if you find anything at Mercy, give us a call, but we've been hearing from them. They're doing okay. They've closed one entrance, but we've heard that Mercy um, is doing all right. Well, next thing we know, Justin is demanding that he, he be on the air, and we heard they're evacuating Mercy. What I found was a line of probably 300 people in a Smurf line, I call it, handing sandbags, one to the next to the next to the next, into the inside of the Mercy Medical Center. And I immediately called back and I said, guys, this is amazing. The medical center right now is in the process of starting evacuating patients because they're afraid they're going to flood massive sandbagging effort going on at Mercy and we just got handed this from Mercy Medical Center. Right, Mercy it says is initiating evacuation of patients at Mercy Medical Center due to the rising flood waters. They have several hundred people here filling sandbags, uh, smurf lining sandbags inside the hospital. They've got two lines of probably, uh, you know, 80 uh, people each uh, smurf lining these sandbags in here right now. Critical patients are being transferred First, by ambulance from Mercy Medical Center in Cedar Rapids, followed by non-critical patients. The hospital is working with the governor's office, Lynn County Emergency Management, and the state emergency operations uh, with assistance from the National Guard to get the patients out of Mercy Medical Center. When you make a decision to uh, evacuate a hospital, you're, you're, quite frankly, you're making a decision uh, that isn't in the playbook. We got just a little bit yeah. coming in right here, right See there. there. Yeah, here, Bill, yeah, we got some right there. there. It's I would say one more pallet, one more pallet, give it a good crunch, stuff on it, and, and then we move on to the next breach. You also recognize that there's an expectation in most communities 
that the last uh, institution to turn its lights out is a hospital. So you don't go into that decision lightly. That was mind-boggling, it really was, when you suddenly realize that at the corner of 8th Avenue and 10th Street that you have one of the two hospitals in Cedar Rapids that's fighting flood water and they're sandbagging like crazy. Water is insidious. Uh, it found cracks, it found openings, and it was coming in through the entryways, into the doorways. Uh, the volunteers not only were stacking sandbags, but they also uh, had brooms and squeegees, and they were pushing water toward pumps uh, that we had located in the, uh, in the Lundy Center. But when we got over to Mercy, um, we struggled with a place to find to park because there were so many people there. And then when we finally got it set up, it was just amazing. Everybody is very frantic here. Lots and lots of people are passing the sandbags along the row here, trying to save whatever they can here inside of the hospital. Um, we are I just talked to somebody from Area Ambulance, and they mentioned to me that they are trying to evacuate everyone as quickly as possible. It obviously is a very stressful situation to try and get these people out of the hospital in an orderly fashion and figure out exactly where they need to go and what they need to do next. Just There is just an outpouring of support here, though, of people loading up these sandbags. I'm telling cars keep backing up here, literally pickup trucks full of sandbags, like tearing into the parking lot, and they immediately get unloaded. An entire, you know, pickup truck gets unloaded in, you know, two minutes. So full of sandbags, because everybody is just so desperate to save this hospital or whatever they can do. Obviously, there's water in the building already, so there is damage to be done. And what I remember was going out and, and climbing up on top of this bank of sandbags right in front of the, the main entrance to the, uh, to the Lundy Pavilion and thanking everyone for coming, telling them we appreciated their efforts, but they had to get out of the water. Um, it was unsafe. Um, a buddy of mine just called me up and uh, just, just said, hey, we need some help to go to actually Edgewood and Glass Road. So we decided to head over there and they just uh, redirected us down here. So we decided to come down to help out. What do you think about this situation down here, all these volunteers coming to help? Honestly, I mean, I'm amazed, you know, your family comes together, friends, people you don't even know, you know, come together as a group and we take care of something like this, you know, especially uh, an important landmark here at the you know, Mercy Hospital, so, you know, I've been all really, you know, I was just amazed. In spite of the fact that storm was coming in, they were in personal danger, uh, they continued to lay in sandbags and between the effort that they made externally and then the, eff uh, the effort subsequently to put sandbags on the interior of the windows because we were concerned that the pressure of the water on the exterior was going to uh, compromise the windows. Uh, that literally, in my opinion, uh, saved the facility. It was both depressing and sad to see it what was happening there, but it was also reassuring and uplifting to see people coming together at just a moment's notice and just the word going out, and we've got to get to Mercy and Sandbag, we've got to get to Mercy and Sandbag, and to see that happening was, was really an experience that I don't think many people will forget in this community. Let's go now to KCRG TV9's Dave Fransman. He has uh, been on a boat tour this morning, seeing these rescues happening. Uh, Dave, what, what can you tell us now? Well, at this point, I can tell you that people are still coming in. In fact, uh, just about five minutes ago, another couple uh, came in. Dave Fransman talked a fireman into taking us out on the river into the flooded area. That was the strangest sensation because I'd never realized that you had to operate a boat on city streets the way you operate a car. When we got into this neighborhood, it was like a dream. Going past St. Patrick's school, uh, Church, going past the Handy Mart on Ellis, going past all these homes, and the water is up probably five feet at least in them, enough to support a boat and, and, and comfortably navigate. I, I couldn't believe my eyes when I, when I was shooting it. I just shot and shot and shot knowing that this is historical footage. And while we were out, they got a call that somebody was in a second floor and, and needed to be rescued. So we pulled up to this house and it was a, a woman, her adult son, 
and a German Shepherd that was about a year or a year and a half old. And the most bizarre things that I remember about that is the dog didn't want to get off the roof and jump into the boat. Now here you're looking at video of the rescue. This is the home of Lisa Armstrong and her son James Fay, and that is Song, their pet, the German Shepherd. That's the reason that they did not leave earlier, despite being in that mandatory evacuation area. In fact, there have been at least three people or couples that have come in to the boat launch area after being rescued. They all had pet dogs, and they all stayed because they were afraid that they wouldn't have a place for their pet. I wasn't going to leave my dog behind. What was it like? I mean, just describe it since you've been in the house there and then not able to leave. It was a nightmare. It was a, it, I, this is a nightmare. I can't believe this. I've never seen nothing like this in my life. And I was around for 93, but this is, to experience it like this is horrible. It is, it's horrible. I'm, I mean, I'm freaking out about it. What, what made you finally decide to call? Because I knew we couldn't stay any longer. Uh, I knew we couldn't stay. Way. No food, there's no water up there. Yeah. I mean, it's like nothing. We couldn't stay there. Come on, come on, come on, come on boy. Hey, come. Now you're looking at video of Coral Bill. You see there in the background with that boat. We've had TV9 Steve Nichols obviously monitoring the Coral Bill in Iowa City area. We'll be checking with him shortly here but those individuals obviously being rescued by authorities um, from their homes you saw the animal cage or the dog cage or the cat cage in there obviously people very concerned about uh, the welfare of their animals as well a lot of the reason why many of the people we've been seen being rescued are being rescued is because they did not want to leave their animals behind That image is just frozen in your head. When you think of Claire Kellett standing alongside the interstate on the overpass, you think of the Dairy Queen. And then you can see beyond her Salem Methodist Church, the water so far up on the windows, and, and just that whole area of that side of downtown just inundated. And we knew we were eventually going to have Claire on the interstate with that shot. But when it finally came on, whew, I saw the anchors kind of just sit back like wow this view that many weren't able to see and you know you drive into downtown cedar rapids you see quaker oats you see the buildings that um, you remember and that is not what grabs your attention when you first drove into downtown cedar rapids that day of the flood it was the dairy queen that had water up to its roof it was the blimpy it was the gas station it was uh, Salem United Methodist Church that was covered in water. We put her on air. Claire, you're there. We finally have this shot up. And, and tell us what you're seeing. And she just stepped out of that shot and said, look at this. Look down the road here. Well, Bruce and Beth, I'm standing on the Interstate 380 bridge going into downtown Cedar Rapids. And the video that we're about to show you here in just a minute is quite possibly one of the worst flooded areas in Cedar Rapids. I'm going to step out of the way so we can show you what we're talking about. Just to give you a few landmarks there, you see the, the blimpy sign down there in the distance there. You know, we're on the uh, west side of the river. This is First Avenue um, coming out of downtown Cedar Rapids. You are looking into downtown Cedar Rapids. If Randy pans over, a little more to the right there, you see the Dairy Queen sign. Look at how high the water is there, almost up to the drive-through sign. That's probably one of the areas where the water was the deepest from the flood. And I drive through there even today and drive past the church and drive past that Dairy Queen building and just look at how high that water got. And it's... It's beyond anything I can even imagine. And it happened. It happened. First and Beth, I know you're just getting this view. We haven't been able to bring you this view uh, very well. Are there any questions that you have or anything you want to point out specifically while we're out here? Uh, we're overwhelmed. Claire, as I know I'm sure you were when you first got on that scene, every time Randy would move the camera to a new section of that area of Cedar Rapids, Bruce and I would, I mean, you almost catch yeah, your, we'll catch your breath. Way. Yeah, you know, if you just look down there, I mean, obviously everybody knows the Dairy Queen sign right there. And like I said earlier, it's almost up to where they put their menu. You see a iron grill sandwich. 
when you talk about the images and you're in the control room and you're producing live continuous coverage day in and day out and what really got us I think Bruce and Beth on the set the staff upstairs we knew, we knew stuff was coming and we knew more live shots were coming and we knew more video was coming and we knew when we got it we had to put it on the air fast and show people what was going on but honestly we were seeing it for the first time live on the air Randy, pan over a little more. We'll get uh, a shot of 3rd Street West here, the stop light right there. You know, there's that church in the background. Randy, if you pan, pan down to uh, see that 3rd uh, Street Southwest and the 1st Avenue uh, Southwest sign there, street sign just inches away from being completely covered. You see the current there hitting the church, obviously very strong. Our executive producer, um, she was in my ear the entire time communicating with me and Salem United Methodist Church is actually the church that she goes to. For somebody who is your boss and who you look up to, and she's in your ear trying to give you instructions, but at the same time she's crying, and um, she's overwhelmed with the water overtaking her church community, that's a little hard. You try to be strong on the air and you try to not show too much emotion, but sometime throughout that day that was just too hard to do. Personally, the church, I mean, live on the air for the first time. Um, we saw, I saw the church underwater, my church. So, so I knew it was gonna be there. We had prepped, we had talked, the managers, they said we're gonna get the shot from the Dairy Queen. Of course, I know the church is across from the Dairy Queen. But, um, you know, it set me back just for a minute. And then we realized, you know, we needed to go back to work. So uh, I had my pastor's cell phone number and uh, got her on the phone. Reverend Bibb, we're looking at video, and I don't know if you're watching your television, of your church right now, and um, I'm, our prayers are with you. Uh, what, what, are, what are you doing right, you know, how are you responding to the shock of this? Uh, well, we are still reeling from, from, the, from the shock, like you would imagine. Uh, the thing that I, that I and so many people from Salem are hanging on to are the wonderful experiences we had on Wednesday, helping each other sandbag. When we talked to Reverend Bibb from Salem Methodist Church, we were all still in a state of shock fueled by adrenaline. And she was very soothing. Her voice was very calming. She was very reassuring. And she talked about, you know, the church is a people. It's not a building. Reverend Bibb, you said you're, you're on the road right now. Um, you know, and I, we're looking at the, the video that, of live of your church, and just to, to let you know, the cross streets there, the water is to the sign at the top, the, the cross street sign. It, it's, it's remarkable, it's unbelievable. It renders one speechless. And uh, the last thing we asked Reverend Bibb before our, our interview as we were looking at Salem Methodist Church just, just totally flooded out, I asked her, do you have anything you want to say to the people of Cedar Rapids or the people of Iowa? Any words of reassurance as a woman of faith? What I would say is very short. Don't fear the future because God is already there. No matter what your denomination was, no matter what your faith, she was a voice to your soul and to just take a deep breath. You're not alone in this. We have each other and through her words, we have a higher power. Like Reverend Bibb said, the, the church is not the building. No. The church is the, the, people. Uh, the people that, uh, and they, they're still going. You've been out uh, in Cascade, Anamosa. Yeah, areas. I was. You know, I was calling it my Highway 151 tour, but then I stopped off in Olin, so that kind of took a little sidetrack there. But that was worth the stop. They are really struggling there in Olin. I'll start with Cascade, though. That's where we went first, um, and we have some video here. This is Cascade. Um, the, if it looks like they're, it looks like a fire hose pump, but actually they're pumping water out a, of a uh, stormwater basin into the river. Mm. Um, that's because the stormwater basin it was filling up too much. It was filling up the, the neighborhood there. And so basically they had to get all the neighbors out of their homes last night. There were a lot of towns that were heavily affected by the flood, but they weren't getting very much media attention at the time because so much of our efforts were focused on Iowa City and Cedar Rapids. Next, we were on to Anamosa, and this is quite the sight to see. 
This is the uh, water treatment facility, and that's underwater, so you can imagine what things are like in Anamosa right now. They stink. There's no other way, better way to put that. It smells bad there. Um, this is now, this is in Olin when we got to Olin. This gentleman's here. Uh, this, his name is John. He took us out for a, a, a tour, and look at this. I mean, like there, that sign just said uh, lakefront property now because everything looks, seems like it's on the lake. So when we got to Anamosa, when we got to Olin, we got all these places, people were thrilled to see us because they want, they had been watching and knowing what was going on, but we're in the middle of the whole thing themselves. So they were happy to see us and happy to give us boat rides around their small communities. We do have a little uh, report uh, from Chris Earle on some of the outlying areas that have had flooding and one of them uh, is Palo. Mm -hmm, including Palo, Blairstown and Marengo. Let's take a look at his story. The town of Palo sits a short drive northwest of Hiawatha on dry days, but look at this right now. Just look at the flooding that's going through this town of about a thousand people. Palo's Dwayne Arnold power plant is also in the middle of the flooding just off the Cedar. Now shifting north to Benton County. Once again, Benton is at the center of high water. Two weeks ago, the city was stood a raging Cedar River. This time the Cedar with all the excess water cuts right through town. On the southern edge of the county, though, is Blairstown. Our cameras caught a town without the obvious flooding of some other places, but still with the effects of high water very clear. South of Blairstown is Marengo. That's the seat of Iowa County. Here in Marengo, you can see the water creeping along the edges of the city, but not necessarily overtaking it. Now take a look at this. In Amana, U.S. Highway 151, this is coming east of town. As you can see here, it's fully underwater. Getting into Amana is not easy at all from the east. Also on the eastern edge of Amana, you can see the extra water coming off the remains of the Coralville Lake, also flowing right up next to the Amana plant. Well, thank you, Chris, for uh, that view from the air, I guess I yeah. should say. And you look at Palo and just see how it is just surrounded yeah. by water. Our producer is telling us our next video tonight. We have some pictures uh, coming up from the Sutliff Bridge, the historic Sutliff Bridge south of Lisbon that uh, became a victim of the river today. And uh, you can see the first span of the bridge. This is uh, now just a, was a pedestrian bridge because of its age. It was well over 100 years old and uh, a historic site. And you can see it going into the water. We'd like now to, John Campbell has put together a report on this bridge that has crashed into the Cedar River. We're down here in Johnson County, right along the Cedar River behind me, the historic Sutliff Bridge. Actually, what remains of the historic Sutliff Bridge, part of it is no longer. It went down about noon. And all, all morning, of course, the river's been coming up and logs and uh, cabin came out of over there and got caught underneath there and just built up pressure and then uh, right around noon another log hit it and just took out that first uh, the, the first arch that we have there. Yeah. Loud explosion or what happened? Uh, a lot of crinkling and breaking uh, steel you could hear. A lot of yeah. big big uh, splash, a lot of uh, crying, people upset that we're standing here and watching of course. She's been standing there a long time hasn't she? 111 years, yeah. Well, we had a lot of people that was pretty upset crying because, you know, it's, it's pretty much part of this community. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's just one of those things. I guess Mother Nature just has a way of taking things once in a while that we don't want her to take. The bridge isn't all that is gone. The river also pulled a cabin from its foundations and sent it floating down river. As for the Sutliff Tavern, it's surrounded by some sandbags and crews were pumping water in and out of the basement trying to keep it from collapsing. As Chuck Kuhn said, you do not rebuild history. This bridge will never be the same. Right now, Randy Howell is just trying to save his business down here on the Cedar River. John Campbell, KCRG TV9 News. Oh man, hate to see that bridge go. That is a very popular spot for so many people in eastern Iowa. People were begging for information. Is my house okay? Have you been to my street? Have you, have you heard about Vinton? It's just another example of there are so many spots like this where we wish we could get to them, um, but there are just too many, and we well, we can't. We get only there. have so many people, so many uh, vehicles, so many uh, reporters, and yeah. and some of them, yeah, like you say, we can't literally can't get yeah. there. She says that because all the bridges are closed, she knows we can't get there. But uh, I mean, that just tears your heart apart. I was getting, I bet, an email a minute. People getting 
pretty testy and, and pretty impatient, begging for video of Iowa City and Coralville. And we'd been saying, it's coming, it's coming, because we knew that our team there was gathering video, was gathering information. It was just the getting it to us part that was, that was not happening quickly enough. And people are begging for Iowa City Coralville color, coverage. We hear you. We have two crews yeah. that are there. We temporarily lost power in this building, and we had to evacuate, and we had to start a new generator. We are trying to get back to Iowa City. I understand we have video in-house. If we could rush it upstairs and even run it raw, we have got to show them no, what is going on in there. Iowa City. I'm sorry if you hear the desperation in my voice, but I, I just feel for the people in Iowa City, this is what's going on right now. People out there were losing patience. I think I was losing patience. And we're so used to, in this business, having everything perfect. We watch the video first. We edit it to make sure it's seamless. We bring it upstairs at a certain time. We hit play at the exact right moment. And I finally said, OK, just get it on the air. I don't care what it looks like. The Iowa Department of Transportation has just released this update as of three minutes ago. They are clarifying that closure of I-380. They're saying they're making preparations to close the north and southbound lanes of I-380, also known as 218 and Iowa 27, between exit 4, that's the North Liberty exit on I-380, and exit 10 between there. That closure is tentatively scheduled for 6 p.m. in about four hours, but they say that uh, they could close it sooner if they keep taking water onto the road. Closing I-380 was big and we kept hearing rumors for a couple of days and when you think detour you think that okay they're going to reroute traffic and you maybe have to drive an extra 10 miles or something but when they showed us the map of what the Department of Transportation said the detour was going to be I mean I think I, I can't remember exactly what I said but I was something like you are not going to believe this okay we have the answer Oh on going from Cedar Rapids to Iowa City or Iowa City to Cedar Rapids and let me tell you if you are making that trip you will not like this answer. Then the DOT came out with the detour for 380 and it was almost comical because it took people on like this four hour journey throughout the state of Iowa just to try to get from Iowa City to Cedar Rapids. That simple little trip uh, back and forth between Cedar Rapids and Iowa City now involves going all the way over to Des Moines uh, if you're in Iowa City, it means going to Des Moines on I-80, up 35, across on 20, back to 380, and then down to Cedar Rapids. That is uh, a detour we're finding out is uh, about 281, 281 miles, 4 hours and 22 minutes at normal speeds. Well, the, the thing that was really interesting about all of this were the emails and phone calls we started getting from people telling us about the shortcuts. Well, we didn't want to put out any of those because we also kept hearing from people that such and such road was washed out. This area, you couldn't get through there. So we didn't want people to try going on sh shortcuts and then suddenly find out that, hey, I'm stranded, or even going at night and suddenly having a road washed out in front of them. Palo has always been known as a you know a wet community, but uh, nothing like this. You know, there's been in the flood of '93, there was only uh, you know, less than a handful of houses, and that that flood that flood was uh, huge. And now this is just uh, you know this just tops anything we could ever imagine. Well, we you know we thought the basement would be affected. We thought the main floor would be okay, so we just thought let's get everything out of the basement. I, I packed for like four days. <laughs> I honestly thought we would be back. That it was kind of more of a scare. Water is definitely rising in the small community northwest of Cedar Rapids. Palo has been through this before. At mid-afternoon, lots of activity at the community center where volunteers of all ages were filling sandbags. Elsewhere, people were moving items out of basements, out of houses to higher places. Many we talked to had not heard of the 4 p.m. voluntary evacuation. Uh -huh. 93, of course, was the big one. Yeah. This is gonna be the, the giant one. If this is going to be the giant one, what are you doing? Are you going to leave town, or what are your plans? Well, first of all, after going fishing this evening, I think I'll just uh, watch it rise overnight, mm -hmm. and then tomorrow, if it's necessary, I will leave and be with friends. 
One person definitely not waiting to see what happens is Carrie Ford. She was moving stuff out of her house with plans to evacuate before nightfall. And then that Thursday when it just wouldn't stop raining, that was kind of a really tough day. Wasn't expecting what we, what we got, but I knew that what I could do to save it was over. It was tough for me. I was, you know, pushing for, you know, I want to protect the community to whatever we had to do. On the other hand, it was, it was hard to want pe make people to leave their homes. And, you know, we just tried to do what was right. I got a phone call from the mayor of Palo, uh, Mayor Beauregard, and he told me that he was willing to arrange a boat tour of uh, Palo. At that point, a lot of the city leaders were asking us, come out to Palo, come out to Palo, because people that lived there were really having a hard time understanding why they were not allowed in their community. Because at that point, no one was allowed in. That was a, a huge deal for everybody because it was the first chance for us to get in and show this community that almost 100% was underwater. And so many people there we're just waiting to see, get a glimpse of how high the water is at my house, how high the water is at my house. The minute I got back in the door, they didn't give me time to freshen up my makeup, they didn't give me time to do anything. They just put the raw tape in, and that was the first video that anybody had seen, that we were the first people to bring video back from Palo to the people who live there so they could see what their homes were like. It is a small community, and it is a tight-knit community, very and it is right yes. now a desperate community for information. Yes. Um, I've had several calls in the last, um, well, I think it was probably an hour ago that we first brought the video to you, um, and I've had several calls, several emails, people wanting to know what I know about Palo. I'm one of the very few people that's actually been inside the city with information about, um, about Palo. So here, let's take a look at the video. First of all, um, this was a boat tour. Um, this is right at the very beginning of it. Um, I'm not positive, I'm sorry, I'm not very familiar with this area, what, what, what the name of the streets are. I know I was on at Lynn Street at one point. Um, this is when you first come into town, I believe off of 94, um, F Avenue turns into 94 there. Um, as you can see, I mean, every house in this town is underwater. Is there anything that you, you know, You've got a lot of people listening right now that you want to say to people, especially the people of Palo, about what's going on? Just bear with us. Uh, our city government is working. We are working so hard. We've been trying to stay ahead of it as much as possible. Uh, just bear with us and work with us. We're not the enemy. We're the ones here trying to, trying to build this town. You know, we're, we're starting from scratch, too. Um, just bear with us and try to be safe and just maintain your composure. And, you know, we're all, we're all, in, the same, uh, we're all in the same picture here, so... Jeff, what about your home? Have you seen it damaged there? Uh, last I heard, I don't, I don't you know, I don't think I've heard about my house, but uh, it's, I'm estimating about six foot in the living room. It was a huge effort to, to get that out to people. You know, there's no other way for people to do it safely besides seeing it on, on the media. You know, and the media did a wonderful job of, of doing that. We really feel for all of you in Palo and uh, the devastation in that uh, small community. It's uh, just unbelievable, 100% evacuation there. And you're just like the Mr. Beauregard said, you just are going to have to have that patience. That's very hard to accept at this point, yeah. and very hard to uh, recognize, but uh, patience is really key at this point. We should point out, we are in the mandatory uh, evacuation area here at TV9, which sounds like we're breaking the rules, but we do have, we have received permission to stay here so we can keep uh, giving information out to the public. We have uh, no use of bathroom facilities, um, <laughs> to put that delicately. We have porta-potties up on the parking ramp. We, um, we also do not have electricity. We are actually operating on a janitor generator and in a in a short time we're going to be as i understand switching generators yes. and if um if there is a moment where we are not with you we want to reassure you that we have engineers doing everything humanly possible to get us back on the air the chief engineer came to me and basically said you know our generator is is failing we were racing against time to a point and it wasn't ever a question of well let's power down and come back up when everything gets fixed it's more of 
okay, let's let's get set up here. If we can do it this way by by doing everything out of a live truck out on the street, let's do it. We're going to be moving out to the front of the building and uh, switching generators, and that's going to take a little while to do that. And we're, we may actually go off uh, for just a few minutes, but we will be back, so don't give up on us. Uh, we're not abandoning you, but uh, it's going to take just a few minutes for us to accomplish that. As a news director in the middle of a crisis and at the height of a flood, there was no way I could, I could think about going off the air. So it was, what do we need to do that we can stay on the air and provide coverage to the people who are relying on us? And I just got in the chair, and Bruce wasn't out there yet because he had to pitch to me from the studio yet. And I look out, and there's every single person I would normally see in the studio during a typical newscast. And we all just kind of held our breath, hoping that us operating out of the van down by the river would work. It was a beautiful day. You know, it was a bright sun, a day much like today. Bright, sunny, lovely weather. Uh, and it was hard to imagine that you were sitting there in the midst of a disaster of the magnitude of this one because it was just absolutely gorgeous outside. I think it was one of the most inspiring things I, I've ever seen, just seeing all these people come together and work to try to build something and protect these vital campus buildings. We are here now on the University of Iowa campus and this is that sandbagging effort there that I was talking about earlier you couldn't see uh, while we were on the phone. I'm joined now by Lynette Marshall from the University of Iowa. She's going to tell us a little bit about this volunteer effort. What's going on here? We've got thousands of dedicated volunteers and we can use some more working on the sandbagging effort to continue to protect these buildings that are closest to the river down here. We're standing in front of the Lindquist building which is the home of the College of Education and we're certainly hoping to fortify this a little bit more. It was becoming apparent that we were going to face something that was beyond anyone's imagination at that point in time. You can see right here, these are all the piles of sandbags that are now getting loaded. See the truck, it's pulling away. That's what they're doing. They're putting them in big piles and th those trucks are then allowing them to move them further down the line here to other places of campus, yet this remains kind of the central area where all the sandbagging is going on. And you might remember just a few minutes ago, there was no sand there and look, there's a whole new pile there waiting for people to load it up. I was out there with one young man and he was very, very intent on building these walls. And I finally, at, at a break, I, I had to take breaks more than the young people did, but at a break I said to him, I said, you're really, you know, really focused on this. I said, what's, you know, what's the motivation here? And he said, well, he says, I love this place. He says, I'm, I'm about to graduate from this place and he says, and in three weeks, my wedding's gonna be in this building. It was the IMU. And I thought, oh, <laughs> poor guy. Uh, and I told him, I said, listen, I said, if this gets as bad as they think, you can have your wedding in my backyard. Um, and unfortunately, his wedding was too large for my backyard and I think they had it either over in Kinnick or in the Levitt Center but he did get married three weeks later. It just wasn't in the IMU. Just an incredible, intense effort that has now, you know, started at 9 a.m. this morning. We're now, and it's about two and a half hours later where this just not let up at all. If anything, it's gotten more intense as more people come down here to help. And they are still looking for more people. If, if you would like to come down here and help out and do anything to help down here, they're looking for you to come down and do what you can. At one point, several of us stood back and we watched prisoners in orange jumpsuits next to Amish people, next to our field hockey team and our football players, all sandbagging together. Talk about amazing sights and images. I mean, it's, it's hard to process that unless you've seen it unless you, you know, you've actually literally seen it and you can see how people, no matter who they are, uh, no matter you know, what walk of life they come from, side by side can do so much. And there is Steve Nichols sitting amidst the sandbags in Iowa City. 
Yeah, that's right, Beth. Uh, there are no people around, so I'm sitting amongst the sandbags made by the people. That's how we're able to do it tonight. To give you an example of how important these sandbags are, I want to show you uh, some video that we just got uh, a little while ago, maybe within the last half hour or so, of uh, the University of Maine Library. And when we take this video, you'll see the library right off the top, and then there's a slow uh, pan with the camera off to where there are the sandbags, and the water is right behind those sandbags. Just an unbelievable effort by students, faculty members, people in the community all coming together there to, to save some very important buildings. And if those sandbagging efforts hadn't taken place down there, the devastation that's unbelievable at the University of Iowa could have been much, much worse. Down in Iowa City, seeing the softball field, it was just out in this lake. And the Coralville Strip was underwater and the houses near the river down by the Marriott and the Normandy uh, Drive area. Uh, you know, these are areas that I was used to seeing normally, I guess you'd say. And all of a sudden, you see them just surrounded by this dark chocolate water that's, that's raging down to the towns we live in. I asked the helicopter pilot to take us up to the dam and then bring us down the river. And I guess for me, um, you know, I'd seen pictures, but as you watch that water uh, literally come pouring over the dam, uh, over the spillway, it takes your breath away. And then as you come down the river and you begin to see landmarks that, you know, like Dubuque Street and Mayflower. Um, at that point, you're speechless. I mean, at that point, there really isn't anything you can say. Let me tell you, we've been at this solid for uh, I mean we've had time where we go home and go to the port of sleep and, and everything too but uh, we've been going very steady now for three days we're not going steady I didn't mean that but we've been going very steady for three days and uh, uh, it's it we're tired we are our, our everybody here tell. at TV 9 is tired uh, but I can't tell you our weariness is nothing compared to what people are going through out there. So it's, don't pay any attention to us if we're getting a little... They're not. A little, uh, they're not, probably. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I mean, the, the emergency workers, the hours they're putting in, I, I look at those sandbaggers, just how many Punched. hours, and they're picking up bags, and they just walk over, pick up two more, and they just keep going, hour after hour. Uh, the, uh, the, people, the people themselves who've been displaced, who are sitting at these shelters, just sitting there, I mean, and so many of them in despair, and the, it's, yes, I, I mean, it's, anyway. No, you're, everything you're saying, the community yeah. is agreeing with. Yeah. I don't normally get too scared going out on boats, I grew up going boating and on the lake and stuff, but this was scary because you don't realize how strong the current is. And there were parts of the Czech village that we weren't able to navigate because it was so strong and the firefighters were saying it would be too dangerous. And there was a time that we had to stop the engine because some piece of plastic was wrapped in um, the propeller and we floated into a house. I mean, you don't realize um, the danger that you could potentially be in. You can see how the current's coming through here. Pretty, pretty quick. I think people realized through that video that um, it was going to be a long recovery in that part of town. We had good times down here. I mean, it was like one great big family. We, like I say, we agitated, kidded, joked, had a few beers. It was just a hell of a good time. That's by and large. It, it, it was a wonderful, wonderful neighborhood. And I venture to say you ain't gonna find too many of them like that. By the time I had gotten back off the boat, there wasn't that many people around and I just saw an elderly man just kind of looking. He was almost kind of doing one of these, trying to see if he could see anything. So I was a little curious, so I walked over and asked him if he had lived there. And it took him a little while to respond to me because he was so 
choked up, and that was his first time back. He was so overwhelmed. I doubt very much if anything's going to reopen down there. To be honest with you, how can a small businessman, like Polina's uh, meat market, for example, how can they afford to go ahead and rebuild and redo everything? I mean, he's just a young fella, you know. How's he going to do it? The fella that uh, has a safari lounge, the bar, and he lost his home. You know, it, it, it's tragic all the way around. And it's amazing. I don't care where you go, you're talking to somebody that's been directly affected by it or one of their relatives has been affected by it. And it, it, it's tragic. It's tragic all the way around, you know. And forgive me, I can talk. He has adult children, and he was calling them to apologize for their lost memories, um, all their childhood memories, their pictures, their toys. Um, you know, he said even they had some of their clothes there that they were saving. Um, it just, I said, Jerry, that's not something that you should be apologizing to somebody for. Nobody knew this, but he just felt so guilty for everything that his family had just lost. That's okay. Tell me how close your community is. I mean, like you said, everybody knows somebody in the oh. area. Oh, real tight, real tight. In fact, believe it or not, an ex-Marine that lived right on uh, C Street, he broke down and cried. He said, we had it made. Everybody talked, we had parties in the summer, and now everybody's going to go the separate ways, and you broke up. You know, it's, it's, it's bad. It's yeah. really, really bad. From day one, I never heard one person say, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. Everybody said, we're over and done with, we're gonna start a new life. So that's the end of our story on this block here anyhow. He sums it up right there, and that was just one of several times throughout the interview that he choked up and, mm. you know, he apologized oh, for I crying and you just no think, no, no, the devastation that he's facing. And I thought one thing that was interesting, he said they exchanged phone numbers um, and they were keeping in contact and no matter whether they rebuild there or move there, he said, um, we're going to go have a beer sometime soon and exchange stories. And Can then he started to laugh. <laughs> we are in desperate need. I don't know, you just try to... So that's what's amazing about the human psyche, though, is there will be a point when people can get together and talk about this and even even tell stories about it. Mm -hmm. But right now, we're, we're not at that point yet, mm -hmm. so yeah. not even close to it. Josh, you were among one of the very few allowed inside that restricted area after the flood. That's right, Beth, and thousands of people, they line up at these checkpoints just like this every day to get back into their homes. The floodwaters have gone down in those areas, but it's still not safe. We had the unique opportunity today to follow the team around who's making that call. Staff Sergeant Randy Schroeder has the first look at what the Cedar River left behind in these homes. Search and rescue! Anybody in here? His Iowa National Guard unit is part of the strike team inspecting the flood-ravaged neighborhoods. A lot of mud, a lot of uh, stench, and it's just uh, pretty sad sights coming into uh, really nice houses and seeing everything wasted and demolished. Everything had been sitting for days as the water went down, and so, you know, all that stuff began to get moldy. Start rotting and you could really smell it. They opened up the door and like a brick wall the smell hit me and it, it's, it's a smell that most people have that have been in the flood zone are very familiar with. It's a musty moldy smell that just punches you right in the mouth when you smell it. Eleven teams like his spread out through the city. They determine what's safe and what's not before residents return. We never imagined you know our, our, our biggest deployment would be in our, our hometown. They started wrapping a, a house with yellow tape because you knew those people weren't going to be able to come back because you looked at their homes and the basements had all collapsed. It was unsafe to be back in those homes. So it was, wasn't just a matter of, you know, a little bit of water damage or something. For some people, they're never going to get to come home.
the city announced that it is allowing some people um, to go visit their homes briefly to take a look, grab only what they can carry, and then get back out. There's been a little bit of confusion. There's been a lot of frustration. We want to go now to one of those checkpoints where some people are, we're being told, being allowed to look at their homes with TV9's Claire Kellett. What can you update us with? Beth, again, a lot of confusion and a lot of frustration here. We're near the Czech Village at 20th Avenue Southwest and Bowling Street Southwest. Now, I'm going to step out of the way so you can see exactly what is going on right now. You see that Cedar Rapids police officer in the middle of this crowd here. He's about to tell these residents who are just eager to, to get a glimpse of their home, to get a glimpse of their neighborhood. He is telling them right now um, when that will be. I think a lot of people got the impression that everybody was going to get in this day. This was on Sunday and um, the line was almost like you see at stores during Christmas, just so long, and everybody had brought their friends because they were gonna try to, and family try to get out as much as they could. People were getting really frustrated. About an hour to an hour and a half ago, uh, there was close to, I don't know if, I don't wanna use the word riot, but there was close to a situation where people were getting very violent, uh, verbally violent, I should say, and were saying things like they were just going to storm the area and there's way more of us than there are police officers. Um, officers were threatening, saying you will be arrested if you go past this checkpoint without our permission. Get him under control now. Well, they told us we could all get in to see our properties at noon and here we sit at damn near 20, or almost 20 after and we're still standing here. Eventually the police said, you know, it's not going to be today. You're not going to get into your homes. And there was a massive line, I mean, blocks and blocks long of people who were expecting to get into their homes. And all of a sudden mass hysteria just broke out in this crowd when they realized they weren't going to be getting into their homes to see how bad the damage was. So we don't even know what it looks like. It's bad. It's not bad. I know it's bad, but, you know, we need to get in there just to look at it and see. That's all. When the city of Cedar Rapids decided around midnight that the checkpoints weren't going to happen the way they'd announced that whole day, uh, we were devastated. We knew that the people wanted to get to their homes. Some needed medication, some needed insurance papers, some needed to check on their pets. You know what, you guys promise one thing one day and then, and then you change your mind the next. I just want my six cats, I won't bother you no more. I think that was the breaking point for a lot of people um, because I think getting back into their homes and seeing what they're used to every day was going to bring some sort of comfort back to them that had been missing for several days. Scott Saville is live on the phone with us. Scott, you are from, you are in Palo? Yeah, actually I'm in Palo right now just outside of town and there's a line of cars waiting to see if they can get in to see their houses. Now they thought at two o'clock that the, that the ones with the green and the yellow will be able to get in and, and start working, but now some had said there might be a hazmat issue inside somewhere mm. and they're just waiting to be here right now if they're able to get in. This is where you live and to think that just about everything you have in your life could have been destroyed within a, a matter of a day, uh, that's got to be affecting people so, so hard and so, hitting them so emotionally and so when you're, you have a sense that I can get back and see it and then all of a sudden they're telling you, no, no, we can't let you back in. I, I can see how people could get angry. Palo residents were told they'd be able to get back in town around 2 o'clock this afternoon, and they lined the streets to get back into Palo, but at about 3.30 they were told there were some problems. We heard a hazmat problem, but that wasn't confirmed. Here are the residents when they were told they weren't getting in. But right now, they are not letting any residents in just yet. They say it continue going through the, uh, the different outlets of media, whether it's the, the website that's out there, the city hall number, uh, the news or the radio, and then that word will be announced at a later date. But at this point in time, we can't let residents in just yet. When we knew that wasn't going to happen, we braced ourselves. We prepared ourselves as a newsroom. You're going to encounter people who are going to be livid, who are going to be just so distraught and disappointed, and be ready for that. So if our FEMA erupts here right <laughs> this second, we still can't get into our house? No, ma'am. They just told us. Well, we understand, we understand that. We were told differently as well, but we're passing on to you what's passed on to us. Some issues occurred. Okay. Do they know about how long? They did not tell us anything yet. They don't know at this time yet. I understand they want to keep people safe, and there's other people that uh, are still underwater, and they want to get in there too. So there's people that are less fortunate than us, but it would be nice to, uh, nice to get some info here. They knew that if they were started to yell at the police, that they were going to get in trouble. 
they couldn't yell at each other, they couldn't yell at Mother Nature, so they just wanted to yell at somebody, so I just let them yell at us. And we were rolling the whole time and getting all this raw emotion on camera. And at one point, a gentleman was shaking his fist, and I saw a couple days later, he ended up getting arrested, just out of anger, sheer anger, frustration. I think one thing that stuck out to me that day is this elderly woman went up to a police officer and said, I don't need to get into my home, but I do need to get the one thing, the most important thing to me that I left behind. And the police officer asked her what that was, and she said it was her cat. And she had the, her a kennel with her, and so she gave it to him, and he put on his waders, and he walked down to where her house was, and he got her cat with some food and brought it back to her. And he, that elderly woman just gave this police officer a hug, and just broke down saying thank you, thank you very much. These are people like me, these are people like my family. Uh, and I can understand their frustration and it, and it hit me like how severe this was. This flood was much bigger than 1993, and I never actually visually thought possible that Cedar Rapids could go under like it did. Um, the previous record at the Cedar River was 20 feet, and I thought, well, there's absolutely no way that body of water can inundate all of downtown, and somehow it actually happened. Two days ago, it seemed that it's as if all the water that has ever been or ever will be descended upon our community. It was then that with fellow council member Justin Shields and Lewis Bunce of the United Way, we saw firsthand what had happened to our neighborhoods. We're blessed um, to be in Cedar Rapids and, and we're blessed because at a time of need, um, again, literally hundreds of people came to our aid. One of the first landmarks that we encountered was a church. It was the church that my mother was baptized in. My parents were joined in matrimony and I was baptized in that church. And I saw devastation and destruction that will forever change me. There are events that mark everybody's life. Um, the floods of 1993, uh, the Washington tornado, the Parkersburg tornado, and of course the, the floods of 08. It'll be a memory that you'll always know where you were, what you were doing, and how you handled that situation. And I think that's kind of markers in time that everybody has in, in different points of their life uh, for different reasons, but this is an event that'll never be forgotten. Close at hand, despair was knocking at the door. So this morning, I was sitting in church. It had a different name and a different location, and yet it was my church. Today's sermon was a reflection on shepherding the flock. What can we do to ease the suffering in our community? And how will we tend the garden? These people here are just fantastic. The, the effort of coming together after this devastation and basically saying, hey, we may be down, but we're certainly not out. And to have a spirit of, we're going to be back. As they passed out paper and pencil to develop database for volunteers, skills, and other resources that will be available for when we ask, I witnessed a different kind of flood, a flood of support. Though despair came knocking at the door, it was slammed shut. There is no home for it here. I think the people that need the recognition are these people, that the flood victims. I mean, man, their strength, their determination, um, their willingness to rebuild their homes, rebuild their businesses, essentially rebuild their lives. I mean, we can cover this and we can talk with them and but then we go home at night and they don't. And so I think they're the ones that deserve all the credit in this. 
I as an individual cannot overcome this blow to our community. But I take solace in knowing that my Creator, in divine wisdom, has given us what we need to continue each other. It's a, a sense of community, and a sense of sharing, and a sense of fellowship, and a sense of love, I think, that uh, has spread through this community, and hopefully it's going to last forever. Thank you.